So we are live in three, two, one. Let's start. So we are live. Okay. Uh, uh, good evening, one and all present here. Uh, today we will discuss a very important topic uh, uh, in the breast cancer because the breast cancer we all know that the, it's, it's, uh, this is the one of the most important as well as the most common breast cancer in women's in India. And uh, uh, most of patients are either present with stage four or uh, they are uh, so, uh, they are becomes as a stage four after few days or few years. So, uh, CA breast stage four is a very important uh, topic and very important disease for uh, Indian population, and especially ERPR positive and HER2 negative, which is the a major bulk in this type of uh, breast cancer, is an important issue because these are uh, slow growing tumors and we have to uh, treat them with uh, good quality of life. So we have to avoid uh, chemotherapy as uh, as possible. Uh, so a CDK inhibitor, the main topic which we will discuss is an important uh, drugs, which will change the era of uh, treatment in uh, breast cancer stage four, especially hormone positive breast cancers. So uh, before uh, coming CDK uh, four and six inhibitors, we have a very less uh, options available for such type of patients and after uh, coming CDK4 and 6 inhibitors uh, we have increased quality of life of these patients and we also have increased the uh, progression free survival as well as overall survival of the of these patients. So first of all I would like to give thanks to Pfizer peoples who gives us to a uh, platform to discuss about this important topic. And now I will invite our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Arpna Dhar, which is HOD uh, in medical genetics and genetic counseling in core diagnostic. He is a very good speaker. And uh, now we will uh, ask them to start uh, her topic. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, sorry, it was slightly late. Um, OK, can you guys see my slides? Yes, ma'am. Please make it full screen, ma'am. It's full screen now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is it okay? Yes, ma'am. All right. Perfect. All right. Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you so much, organizers, for having me here today. And I've uh, been given quite the task to speak on the molecular treatment landscape of breast cancer. So without much further ado, we've got a lot to talk about. So let's get started. Um, so in 2022, we know that molecular profiling has become the new norm. And the reason being is we've actually understood that humans can have different profiles that require different therapies. One, oops, sorry, one target, one drug could not treat, you know, multiple tumors. Sorry, one, one drug can actually treat multiple tumors like agnostic markers. We've also learned that one target, one drug actually leads to resistance. We know that one target, one drug does not really inform you of all the other potent targets. And one target, one drug does not always give you the entire picture. So before we talk about uh, the molecular landscape of breast cancer, tumor biology for me is very, very important. So breast cancer patients are classified as for, we know the ERP. Of these cases, and the treatment options are usually chemotherapy, then the HR positive, um, then you've got your HR positive disease, which is around 70% of our patients and hormone therapy is the mainstay of treatment. And then around 15% are the HER2 positive where anti-HER2 therapy improves significantly the prognostic outcome in both early and in advanced settings. But here's the thing, we've actually moved beyond this intrinsic subtype, such as your, uh, you know, HER2 positive, your luminal age, your basal-like subtype, to look at more genomic drivers where, you know, you've gone beyond your simple classifications. We're looking at alterations in the, PI, in the PIC 3 ca pathway. We're looking at DNA repair genes. We're looking at resistance mechanisms in the ER signaling pathway and more growth, you know, into growth factors like your FGFR1, which could potentially allow us to have more targets which in turn will allow us to personalize treatment strategies in patients with breast cancer. And this is becoming more and more important in patients with metastatic disease. So this is molecular landscape, and we know that it's very, very heterogeneous. And as you can see on the slide, that even within the subtypes of HR positive, the triple negative uh, subtype, 
give a plethora of different somatic mutations that can occur. And if you look at the differences between early and metastatic, you can actually see that there are nine driver mutations to TP53, ESR1, AKT, were more frequently mutated in the ER positive metastatic uh, breast cancer versus early. And again, in your metastatic triple negative, it showed an increase in the frequency of somatic biallelic loss of function mutations associated in the genes, um, you know, mutations in the genes, sorry, that are not associated, that are related and perform homologous recombination repair. So metastatic breast cancer had an increase in the mutational burden and clonal diversity compared to the early breast cancers. So the poster child for building molecular profiling treatment algorithms has always been lung cancer. And I'm going to try and do it with breast cancer. Again, this is a very simplistic view of patients with breast cancer. This flow chart, this flow chart essentially alludes to the fact it assumes that you, one, is that you only have three biomarkers, that is ear, PR, and heart immune. It also assumes that, two, that these biomarkers stay static. And we know that when a patient's tumor records or when a patient has stage four, de novo, or on progression, these biomarkers are not static. In about 30% of patients, ERP or Hortony could have a potential loss of gain of function. It also assumes that there's only one pathway that is dominant, which again, in a bit, we're going to see that you really need to see the different pathways that are activated to help treat your patients. Now, this is a very simplistic view of patients with metastatic breast cancer, where chemotherapy option Chemotherapy is your option of choice. And as you can see, the PFS decreases with each line of treatment. So if you look at the tumor biology of triple negative breast cancer patients, we know that they're typically associated with the worst prognostic outcome. And if you can see from this heat map over here that patients with triple negative breast cancer, it's not as simple as we think it is. Even among... <coughs> Even amongst this group of patients, we see subtypes like luminal AR, mesenchymal, basal immune suppressed, basal immune activated. And among each of these subtypes, we actually have a very different strategy. So you've got immunotherapy for your basal immune activated subtype. You've got immunotherapy for those with alterations in the DNA damage repair pathway. You have your uh, immunotherapy combinations in your basal immune suppressed subtype. And of course, you've got this anti-androgen therapy in your luminal AR. So really, it's not a very simplistic view. So this is what I think is the optimal molecular diagnostic algorithm for our patients with triple negative breast cancer. You can target the defect in the DNA damage repair pathway where we know PERP and platinum therapy have very clear roles. You can actually target those inflamed phenotypes where immunotherapy has, again, a very clear role. You've got the AR pathway, and if positive, we've got agents. You've got alterations in the PA3K pathway where we've got AKP inhibitors. And last but definitely not the least, those agnostic markers like NTRK fusions, you know, and you've got your RET, um, a RET mutation, which we know is an, which has got an orphan drug. Um, it's been it's been labeled as an orphan drug, sorry. And there's just so much more data coming out, like you know, T790M for EGFR, which is synonymous with uh, lung cancer and SCLC in particular. But now we actually there is a lot of data coming out of how we are seeing this in our triple negative subtypes. So this is a forever evolving um, algorithm. But I'm very quickly going to walk you through, through the data that I have used to build this particular algorithm. So we've got the Impassion 130 trials for triple negative breast cancer patients, which illustrated that in the PDL PDL one positive cohort, an improvement in OS as depicted, you know, as you can see in the depicted here in these captive wire curves, then you've got the triple negative patients with germline BRCA mutations, and we've got the MPRACA, the Olympia trials, that again alluded to the fact that if you have a mutation uh, in the biomarker, and the biomarker here being BRCA1 and BRCA2, and the PARP inhibitor was given, you see a very, very nice separation in these captain Meyer curls, which is favoring the group of patients who received a PERP inhibitor. And this is some very interesting data from a phase two uh, trial where triple negative breast cancer patients received a combination of chemotherapy in the form of acrisaxel and capybrosetib, which is a target for the PI3K pathway. It's an AKT inhibitor. And what you see is, again, a very, very nice separation of those captain Meyer curls, which is, you know, favoring the patients who were, who were getting this combination versus those tumors that did not have an alteration in the pathway. 
So let's look at the molecular diagnostic algorithm of the HR positive and the HER2 negative subtype. And these patients not only have ERPR as potential biomarkers, but we also need to look at the different pathways, such as those that acquire an ERPR1, because we know that agents such as, um, um, what do they call it? Uh, aromatase inhibitors do not work very well, and you need to look at agents such as fulvestrin. Again, in the HR positive, there can be defects in the DNA damage repair pathway where PARP inhibitors can work, and this is what we get from the Olympic trials. And we also look into the AKT pathways, and of course, there are those agnostic markers. Now, in the HR positive cohort, I think understanding the tumor biology of the disease should be the new norm. And, you know, it's, it's so very important, and the reason being is that patients uh, do acquire that endocrine resistance. And you can see it's a very nice animation over here where you see patients who are endocrine resistant. They were endocrine sensitive and the tumors have a very small clone of either ESR1 mutations and then they're still giving them hormonal therapy. So about 18% acquire an ESR1 mutation. 13% have a problem uh, you know, or a defect in the MAP kinase pathway and about 9% have acquired mutations in the MIC pathway. And again, these are acquired genomes uh, alterations, which eventually results in endocrine resistance. So let's very, very quickly go through the various pathways that are associated in our HR positive through advanced or metastatic breast cancer. So I'd like to begin with the CDK4, CDK6 pathway. And these CDK4, 6 inhibitors act as, they act as the G1 to S uh, cell cycle checkpoint. And this checkpoint is tightly controlled by the D-type cyclin and CDK4 and 6 and overexpression and over overexpression and um, overregulation in the ER positive patients. It actually results in what we call instigating a mitogenic uh, signal. And these signals cover, you know, they converge at the cyclin D1 messenger RNA and there's a protein upregulation. Uh, where cyclin D1 goes, it binds to the cell cycle dependent protein kinase of CDK4 and CDK6. Now, this activation leads to what we call the phosphorylation of retinoblastoma, uh, which is so uh, retinoblastoma protein, which is the RB protein. And this, you know, this releases RB protein suppression of the E2F transcription factor, which allows the cell to proceed through the cell cycle, which, which is essentially going from G to S. So what happens over here is that the ATP competitive inhibitors like palgocyclib, ribocyclib, abemocyclib, uh, these block the cyclin D1 um, CDK4-6 complex and actually prevents the uh, phosphorylation of RB protein, thus preventing progression through the checkpoint of G1 to S. Now, in addition to CDK4-6 inhibitors, we also give patients aromatase inhibitors. And the reason being is that these complement the CDK4-6 inhibitors. And what they do is they actually block the enzyme aromatase, which turns the hormone um, androgen, you know, it, which it actually, it turns the, um, it turns the hormone um, androgen into small amounts of estrogen in the body. So what you're doing is that because you're blocking that, you're further lowering the levels of estrogen in the body. And patients usually have an excellent PF uh, PFS of such combinations, uh, you know, once a patient progresses, one of the most common resistance mutations we do see is the ESR1 and the PIK3CA. Again, PIK3CA uh, inhibitors are always given with fulvestrin, which again is a down regulator of ER. And it essentially what it does is it delays the uh, resumption of the S phase entry and abrogates the accumulation of cyclin D1. So when you start treating these patients with CDK4-6 inhibitors, we're actually setting the stage for the tumors to eventually progress onto this therapy and you know, develop resistance, which can then impact the subsequent treatment decisions. So with respect to resistance to CDK4-6 inhibitors, this, I think this paper very beautifully reviewed it. And what it did is it divided them into two big groups. On one hand, you have um, a cell cycle, which was very non-specific mechanism things that, you know, that would alter the, that would alter the signaling pathway outside the cell's machinery itself. And then you have changes that happen within the cell cycle machinery. So among those, um, so among the cell cycle non-specific mechanisms, I think the one that I really want to highlight and is very important is the loss of ER. 
there is a very small subset that can actually lose ER on CDK4-6 inhibitor resistance. And most commonly this happens because there are changes at the receptor level with FGFR amplifications, uh, amplification, sorry, or uh, changes in the signaling components within the PI3K kinase pathway, including changes in the PI3 kinase itself. So it could be AKP or M4 signal. Now, in terms of cell cycle dependent or uh, specific mechanisms, there you would expect the common mechanism to be the loss of RB. Luckily for us in breast cancer, we don't see that very often. Otherwise, it would really be it would be very very nasty. It'd be catastrophic. But like you know, we see these cell transformations, like let's say from NSCLC to SC uh, to small cell lung uh, cancer. What we generally tend to see are amplifications in CDK4, six, uh, CDK4, CDK6, etc. Another thing to point out is that from the very beginning, you know, that these targets are not, again, static. And I go on repeating, uh, you know, talking about being static and not static, rather, in this uh, particular subtype. And that is because they're not just there kind of on its own. They are interconnected in this very tight mesh of signaling molecules in a sort of very simplified version. I usually show, uh, where did it go? Oops, sorry. Oh, here you go. Sorry. I kind of show it in this very, um, you know, in, in this triangle. And what this triangle does is it emphasizes the three most important nodes in the signaling network. On one hand, you have the, you know, the, um, the ER, and on the other hand, you have your CDK4, 6, and up there, you've got your PI3K, uh, PI3 mm -hmm. kinase pathway. And whatever you do, the PI3K, the ER positive breast cancer, you know, with one of these angles, you know, if you just go and you block one, so for example, if I go and I, let's say I block this ER over here, the PI3K and the CDK4-6, they act up. So if you block the PI3K on its own, the ER signaling goes up. And this is why if you see, we never ever give quick PC, you know, PI3K kinase inhibitor as a single agent, because you have this adaptive in that is, um, you know, you have this adaptive increase, um, you know, for the other components in this very the other components in this triangle. And in addition, this triangle also shows the new age of clinical trials. You know, we've, we've, we've actually had a lot of success in, de in developing these various doublets, you know, whether it is endocrine therapy with CDK inhibitors or hormonal therapy with, with PI3K or mTOR. And there's a new wave of clinical trials which are focused on developing uh, regimens that, you know, at the same time target all three angles. And uh, there's a series of trials that are going on uh, within these triplets, you know. So again, some, some great information and data just around the corner. Now, coming back to it, we know that somatic mutations that differ between early and late or, you know, in metastatic breast cancers and especially in our ER positive subtype. And this was a thing that's been very interesting for the last couple of years is the identification and the uh, development of the tumors which are acquiring what we call an ACOBEC signature in high TMB. And this could be a potential uh, biomarker. So I like using, oops, 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 sorry. Um, I like using this uh, case study. I think it was, it was presented in ASCO 2018. And this patient initially had an ER positive breast cancer in 2001, had the appropriate treatment for early stage breast cancer. And eventually there was recurrence in 2010. And then you can see that even after multiple lines of therapy in 2015, they went ahead, they did molecular profiling, they found an Applebeck high signature. And she was initiated, uh, she was eventually, sorry, uh, treated with immunotherapy in the form of pembrolizumab and chemotherapy, and she did respond. So again, one of case study, but this is very, very promising data. Uh, solar one trials, I've already spoken about PIK3CA, but uh, you know, the cohort of patients with PIK3CA mutations that were treated with a combination of colvestrin and alpha which is a PIK3CA inhibitor, we saw a very good response. And what I want to highlight here, it really did not matter if you caught this uh, mutation on a liquid or a tissue biopsy, it made no difference at all. The efficacy, everything was the same. In fact, liquid biopsy has a potential to, because it's more sensitive, higher depth of coverage, it's able to catch these mutations versus tissue biopsy. And I've said this before, that you can acquire a HER2 mutation. And over time, we've seen this more so, you know, even in our, we've seen this more so often in our patients with a HER2, uh, with a HR positive breast cancer, sorry. So this was 
the phase two summit trial that you know looks at patients with HR positive or two mutant breast cancer and gave them a combination of neratinib with fulvestrin. These were again very heavily pretreated patients, and this combination did result in a clinical benefit rate of around 47% and a PFS of around five months. So again, if I just look at this um, algorithm. I've just made it a little bit personalized for our HR positive patients that are being treated with aromatase inhibitors and CDK46 inhibitors. And um, with the flavor of the season being carb inhibitors everywhere, I wanted to very quickly draw your attention to a very important concept that we call BRCA reversion. So, and this is especially in our heavily pretreated patients. BRCA reversion is a phenomenon whereby uh, a BRCA is a phenomenon whereby your BRCA alterations have the potential to restore their reading frames and revert back to their wild type sequence or remove an initial deleterious alteration and restore at least a partial BRCA function. And this is especially uh, seen in our uh, BRCA2 is more susceptible to this. So this was a very beautiful case study. I think excellent case study that, you know, that can help demonstrate this concept. This was a heavily pretreated uh, patient with um, um, you know, a uh, heavily pretreated uh, HR positive, HER2 negative breast cancer patient, multiple lines of therapy. Eventually, they went ahead, they did um, germline testing, they found a BRCA mutation. The same BRCA mutation was, germline mutation was also caught on her tissue. She was treated with the pulp inhibitors. She had a PFS of around uh, eight months and she progressed. They added chemotherapy, she continued to progress. And at this point, they did a liquid biopsy, which actually helped in identifying that there was a BRCA reversion, which is why she was not sensitive. So, um, um, you know, she, she was not, um, one sec, she was, has, is my slide moving? Um, sorry, has the slide moved? Is someone from the organizing team, is it moving? Um, okay, I, I guess it's moving. So we know that ESMO has actually come out, you know, with a scale for the clinical actionability of molecular targets, specifically with uh, breast cancer. And as you can see, the, you know, the level one, level two, um, evidence, it tends to be in terms of looking for her to amplifications, you're looking at germline BRCA mutations, uh, you've got your pic 3 c your MSI, your NTRKs, your P10 loss, your AKT1 mutations, and then we also have a plethora of different uh, targets, which, you know, um, uh, different targets, which has less evidence that supports it, but we still look at them because, you know, there are clinical trials that are investigating in them. And then we move on to, um, because I did talk about liquid biopsy, and we know that, you know, this cancer being a very heterogeneous disease, um, we know that because of that, you have both inter and intratumoral um, problems, you know, when you're trying to trace those biomarkers in your patients. And one of the very easy ways to really look at that genomic landscape is a liquid biopsy. And essentially what you're looking at is the CT DNA. This is the circulating tumor DNA, which is the somatic or the tumor DNA, which is being discarded into the bloodstream. And the CT DNA is isolated and studied. So CTC is essentially the entire cell that's just discarded into the bloodstream. There's a lot of amazing work happening in that area too, but due to paucity of time, I'm not going to be talking about it today. What we are going to do is try and understand as to how liquid biopsy is actually helping our metastatic breast cancer patients. Uh, we could actually detect, uh, we can actually use it to detect two types of resistance mechanisms. The first one is you would be looking at linear clonal evolution, which basically involves, uh, you know, your tumor cells where you have a temporal um, evolution where one dominant clone, you either lose the dog, you, you know, where you lose the dominant clone and one of the less dominant becomes dominant over time, you know, which gets selected out with therapies. And the second one is what we call a branch clonal evolution, where you have a spatial evolution in terms of divergence of your different clones that happen. And what you essentially get is a mixture of different cancer cells resulting in resistance. Now, um, ma'am, sorry to interrupt, kindly conclude your talk. Uh, yeah, I just need, I think I need oh. two minutes. Oh, okay, ma'am. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. So, um, 
Yeah, okay. So with uh, liquid biopsies, again, in, uh, you know, you've got various aspects of, uh, we can use it in various aspects of clinical practice and uh, screening and reference is again, work in progress, but we are using it in the metastatic setting. What we have seen, be it the mirror study, be it this particular example, what it does illustrate, and because I don't have time, so I'm just like, we're going to go through it. It does help us actually calling out those mutations in advance. So the mirror study was also done as a head on head with tumor with the tissue and uh, with the liquid biopsy in metastatic cases. And we saw that liquid was able to call out more mutations because it had a higher depth of coverage. Similarly, over here, this ESR1 mutation was actually called out as early as Feb, whereas in tumor, they were able to call it out only in, um, they were only called it out in July. So and liquid biopsy mutations is extremely important. The same thing is getting, uh, you know, mentioned over here. So I do think that, you know, to sum it up, I think in, um, in breast cancer, I think today, the way we practice, it is important to understand the tumor biology because it's the tumor biology, which in turn helps you understand and guide and navigate through your treatment options. And if you are using uh, PARP inhibitors, please tend very carefully in those heavily pretreated patients. And on that note, thank you so much for your patient listening. I'm sorry, I didn't realize I lost. Um, thank you so much, ma'am. Now I would like to invite Dr. Surinder Veniwal uh, for his talk. He is a professor and senior consultant medical oncologist, PBM Hospital Bikanwe. Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are audible. Sir. Thank you. Thank you Take very full much. Full screen, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank, uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Apna Dhar. As, as the madam said that the tumor biology is the most important for breast cancer. Uh, I think the tumor biology is most important for each and every uh, cancer. Uh, because uh, each and every cancer is a heterogeneous disease and individual cancer is itself a new cancer. So we have to understood the biology of uh, tumor and progression of science uh, regarding this uh, understanding of this biology of cancers. And uh, nowadays we are able to do the individualized treatment of uh, patients in the breast cancer. And that's why we can improve the survival as well as we also improve the quality of life with decreasing the side effect by individualizing and personalizing the treatment of breast cancer. So the breast cancer is one of the most leading uh, cancer in the world. According to the Globin 2018, breast cancer is approximately most common, uh, I think second in rank, but approximately same as the lung in incidence as well as its fifth rank in uh, mortality. Uh, uh, due to the breast cancer, uh, approximately 6.6% of the uh, uh, cases of breast cancer are uh, breast cancer deaths in all um, cancer deaths. So this is one of the most important cancer. And in uh, data from the India, uh, the breast cancer now the first rank in cancer incidence and the mortality for women and as well as well in both sex in combined. Breast cancer is nowadays the first in rank. Initially, cervix is the most uh, common cause of cancer in women and the head and neck is the most common cancer in men. But nowadays, as a whole, as well as in the women, the first uh, rank is in the, of, uh, of the cancer is the breast cancer. While in only male, the lip and oral cavity is still in the first rank. And in women, the breast, as uh, usual, the breast cancer is the most important breast cancer. Uh, metastatic, now we will discuss about the metastatic breast cancer because our today's topic is CDK6, 4 and 6 inhibitor. This was indicated only in advanced and metastatic breast cancer. Roughly 30% of women who have had early disease will develop advanced metastatic breast cancer in their remaining life. And 6 to 10% of all women with the breast cancer presents with advanced metastatic disease at the time of initial diagnosis. And this data is much higher for Indian population. Well, these data are uh, not from Indian population. These data are from US and uh, Western countries. So In sorry to interrupt, but your slides are not moving. Okay. 
now slides are moving or not moving not moving sir not moving in my uh, screen these slides are moving so sir, just ek bar aap remove karke fir se kariye usko okay okay Slides are moving or not? Not. So, so you need to make it full screen first. Yeah. Right now, I have, I think full screen. So I will. It's it's slide. it's not in a full screen mode. Okay. Uh, sir, just a second, sir. Okay, okay. Acha, okay, okay. I will. Please approve my request, sir. Yeah. So visible my request? No. Sir, पहले आपका जो स्लाइड शो वाला जो विंडो है वो क्लोज कर दीजिए सर ओके अब सर वापस एक बार शेयर स्क्रीन बटन पे क्लिक कीजिए और वापस शेयर कीजिए आपका प्रेजेंटेशन सर now now we can see your screen it is in full screen so you can go ahead with metastatic breast cancer at the time of diagnosis so metastatic breast cancer is an important topic and we can divide metastatic breast cancer in two uh, headings uh, one is the virulent metastatic breast cancer another is the indolent in virulent form they are usually rapidly progressing they have a re very rapid metastasis they have visceral involvement they have visceral crisis very short uh, disease free survival and they are resistant to endocrine therapy in such type of breast cancer we have to give chemotherapy but on the other hand there are a uh, few uh, windowland biological behavior in metastatic breast cancer with long disease free survival late recurrence of the metastasis only bone uh, metastasis or soft tissue metastasis not visceral metastasis and usually these type of breast cancers are sensitive to endocrine therapy and uh, most of Uh, hormone positive and hard to negative breast cancers are indolent breast cancers they behave as a chronic disease so we have to treat these uh, type of cancers with a uh, uh, less uh, 
uh, extensive treatment with the less side effect. So we will discuss about the cycline uh, D1 and cycline 4 and uh, CDK4 and 6. This CDK4 and 6 will help uh, in proliferation of the cells and they will regulate the G1 and S cell cycle. So if we will hit on this type of uh, this uh, point, so uh, we can uh, uh, stop the proliferation of uh, cancer cells. And uh, by this mechanism, we will inhibit CDK4 and 6 and we will stop the proliferation of the cancers. And the first in class CDK4 and 6 inhibitor, which was come in clinical uh, use is the palbociclib. This is an orally active selective inhibitor of CDK4 and 6. It inhibits cell proliferation and cellular DNA synthesis by preventing cell cycle progress from G1 to S phase. So it, it is an active in various type of cancers, but uh, their indication is uh, only in the uh, breast cancers. So the indications for women uh, of the palbociclib are first is the hormone positive and HER2 negative locally advanced in metastatic breast cancer in combination with an aromatase inhibitors or in combination with fulvestant in a woman who have received prior endocrine therapy. If we use this in pre and perimenopausal women, then we have to give luteinizing hormone, uh, releasing hormone uh, to become these women as a postmenopausal. For the women, palbociclib is indicated for the treatment of hormone receptor positive and HER2 negative advanced or metastatic breast cancer in combination with aromatase inhibitor as an initial endocrine based therapy or in, with the fulvestant who have received one previous prior therapy. And now we will discuss about the some real world evidence uh, of the palbociclib. We have discussed various type of trials, but these trials are usually uh, uh, done in the hospital. But that usually the data from the uh, trials of the randomized trials and data from the real world are uh, not same. So the important data from the real world are uh, are more important because we have to treat the patient. Uh, not in the trial, we have to treat in, in real scenario. So data from the real world evidence is more important than the various trials. So today we will discuss about data of real world regarding the palbociclib. And we will discuss about these few real world data. One is the iris. This is a retrospective medical chart review. It was taken from multiple countries like US, Argentina, and total 1831 patients are uh, taken, were taken in this study. Second is the uh, Flanterion study, third is the Polaris and next one is the extended access program. We will discuss one by one. First is the uh, Flanterion study. In this, they will uh, took more than 280 cl uh, clinics and they will uh, choose 1800 sites for the care and more than 2.2 million active patients and what they found, uh, they took approximately 772 patients who are in palbociclib and uh, latrozole town and 652 658 uh, patients from the latrozole uh, alone trials while in uh, uh, this this is the characteristic of patients in this they use uh, uh, they took mostly postmenopausal patients and the, uh, according to this approximately 50% of the patient are uh, at the diagnosis uh, with stage 4 and with the only 57% uh, patients has visceral metastasis and six, approximately 64% patients has bone only disease and uh, only 2.5% patients has a bone metastasis. So in this uh, what the results they found In the real world, progression-free survival and overall survival, what they found that the overall progression-free survival was 19.7% uh, for uh, palbociclib arm, while 11.9% for the letrozole arm, while overall survival is also uh, uh, not reached in the palbociclib arm, while uh, only 40.3 months for the letrozole arm. So uh, progression-free survival are approximately double for uh, palbociclib arm. And the two-year overall survival rate among patients who received palboxyclip plus leprozole versus leprozole over 80.1% versus 63.3%. Uh, 
while if we uh, uh, this did by the propensity scoring matching uh, data in what we do in the propensity scoring matching data we will try to randomize according to randomized try uh, this is a statistical method in in this they will try to match both uh, experimental as well as control arm as a randomized control trial and according to this the progression free survival was approximately more than double uh, for pelvosiglav arm while uh, his survival is still not reached for uh, pelvosiglav arm while the 43.1 month for the lateral arm so we have to follow this study for more time to mature the data of survival survival and this uh, table shows that approximately all type of patients have a response to pelvosiglav arm except uh, race uh, in, in the race there is no difference but approximately all patients either they have brain metastasis either they have only bone metastasis or they have vessel metastasis all have very good response to pelvosiglav arm while uh, in bone only disease there is a very good response with pelvosiglav arm so approximately all type of characteristic behavior with breast cancer hormone positive have a very good response to pelvosiglav arm so in conclusion the real world setting first line pelvosiglav plus letrozole is more effective than the letrozole alone in heterogeneous population and among various patients group and after propensity scoring matching hazard ratio is 0.8 for progression free survival and 0.54 for overall survival which is very uh, good hazard ratio these data complements the superior clinical efficacy observed with the cdk46 inhibitor in randomized clinical trials Although the median overall survival was reached in the letrozole alone group, but significant censoring in the OS analysis highlights that the need to subsequent evaluation for the long term follow. So we have to mature overall survival data. Now we will discuss about the iris study. In iris study, uh, retrospectively, medical chart reviewed in different part of the world, including US as well as some European countries. And the analysis of treatment pattern and the clinical outcome among patients receiving pelvosiglip as initial endocrine therapy for hormone positive and HER2 negative metastatic breast cancers. And uh, what they found in, in USA, they found approximately 84.1% progression free survival. And uh, six, uh, at the time of uh, first year, and while 64.3% at the uh, after the two year in uh, pelvosiglip arm. This is a very good uh, uh, data, and in this they found that approximately 11 percent percent has a progression, uh, very uh, complete, complete response, while 68 percent percent has a partial response. And uh, it, when they uh, did the, with the falbosiglav and falvestan, they found 79.8 percent uh, progression-free survival in the first year, and it and uh, oral survival 87.9 percent. While in European words, approximately same 81.1% uh, and 96% in first year and 24 uh, on 24th month, 55 and 85%. And in this, they also found approximately 10% percent has complete response rate. So in second real world data, they also found that the pelvosiclip in combination with either AI or Falvestan demonstrate a favorable effectiveness in the term of PFS as well as in survival rates. And a higher proportion of patients initiated pelvosiglip at a standard dose and the low rate of dose reduction were observed. This demonstrates that there is a good pelvosiglip tolerability among the European populations. So uh, they need a very less uh, uh, decrease in pelvosiglip uh, dose. Real world response and the clinical benefit rate were similar to those in the clinical trials. And the ongoing study are needed to deliver mature clinical uh, outcome data beyond 12 and 24 months in the real world setting. In a Medline study, in Medline study, uh, they are uh, trying to uh, demonstrate that what is the side effect of these drugs and how these patients uh, tolerate these drugs in the real world, what they feel about this drug, what, uh, uh, what type of side effect they uh, felt and, uh, in, in the real world. So as we all know that in PALMAT 1 and 2 trial, the neutropenia is the most common hematological side effect in uh, of the CDK4 and 6 inhibitor in valvosiclip. Approximately, we all know that approximately 80% percent patients has neutropenia and approximately 36% percent patients has a grade 3 neutropenia in valvosiclip 1 and 2 randomized control trial. But what they found in randomized control trial that the 
Fibronectopenia was found only in the two percent of cases. It means that the pelvic limb has a very high rate of neutropenia, even grade three, but they have a very less infection rate due to neutropenia. It means neutropenia due to pelvic limb is not as hazardous as the chemotherapy. Uh, why this happens? Because the what is the mechanism of action of neutropenia uh, due to these drugs? Because these drugs are CDK4 and 6 inhibitors, and the progenitors of uh, neutrophils in their uh, parental phase, uh, they regulate the cell cycle of these progenitors with uh, regulating CD4 and 6. And CDK6 is more important for stopping uh, mature, uh, maturation of uh, neutrophils. That's why uh, they have a neutropenia, but these are the static drugs. So these are reversible. And uh, after uh, stopping these drugs, the recovery is uh, very good. Uh, so uh, there is no need to uh, give a, a growth factor and there is very less hazardous uh, febrile neutropenia in these type of patients. While uh, its counterpart like albeviciclib has a very less neutropenia because uh, this drug has a more uh, effect on CDK4 rather than the CDK6. So the uh, palbociclib and ribociclib has a more neutropenia while albeviciclib has a more fatigue and diarrhea because uh, it effects on the CDK4, while the, they have more effect on CDK6, that's why they have more effect of neutropenia. So in Medline US uh, real world data, this is a multi-centric design to elevate the patient reported outcome. I think this is the most important uh, study because at least uh, our aim of treatment to treat the patient, uh, we have to satisfy the patient, we have to treat the symptom of patients with the less side effect. Uh, we uh, we have to treat side effect of side effect as well as the symptom of the patients, not their radiological findings. So in this, what they did they did 152 neutropenic events were experienced among 62 patients, and out of these, 28 percent experienced one event, while 15 percent experienced two events, while 19 percent experienced three or more events. And the median duration of neutropenia across all grade was 87 for four, four days. And evaluation of patients reported outcomes shows no association between neutropenia and decreased quality of life because there is uh, very less uh, infection rate in neutropen uh, due to neutropenia of CDK4 and 6 inhibitors. So very less decrease in quality of life. And uh, in uh, these tables shows that uh, there is a uh, approximately same quality of life in neutropenic and non-neutropenic uh, patients. So due to neutropenia, there is uh, no much side effect. Although almost half of these patients experienced neutropenia at the same point during the study, the patients with neutropenia did not show decrease in the quality of life during the study, nor did they fare worse relative to those who did not experience neutropenia. Patients maintained quality of life throughout the follow-up period. And a daily PR was collected suggests that a low level of pain and fatigue that does not Sense sub subsequently over the time, regardless of experience with the neutropenia during the study. So the conclusion of this study is that, that the neutropenia related to pelvic cleave is not a worrisome. So uh, we did not worry about the neutropenia, although we have to watch uh, these type of uh, findings. So before starting uh, pelvic cleave, we have to do the CBC. And in first and second cycle, we have to uh, watch seven to 15 days. And after first and second cycle, we can uh, uh, do this uh, every four weekly or uh, six weekly. The next one is the treatment uh, satisfaction survey. This was done and uh, wave based. This is a wave based uh, survey. And uh, in this was uh, done in uh, USA and Canada. This is observational cross sectional wave based survey of the 604 patients identified between September 2017 to January 2018. And the self reported heart hormone positive metastatic breast cancer with HER2 negative identified online 18 year older were taking pelbocycle plus AI or pelbocycle plus fulvestant or as per approved indication for more two or more months. And the questionnaire were administered in the six countries. And this, uh, this is the questionnaire. Uh, we have, uh, we have, they have tried to uh, uh, do uh, domains of expectations of therapy, feeling about the side effect and satisfaction with the therapy. And these are some questions how they, uh, after starting therapy, they either they return to normal their life, they get rid of cancer, prevent cancer from coming back, or at least they stop the cancer from spreading. 
and either this drug help you live longer and feeling about the side effect pelvosically either limit their daily life activities upset about the side effect taking pelvosical as dif uh, difficult as expected and were side effect expected as uh, as expected and satisfaction with the therapy worth to taking even with the side effect thinking about stopping pelvosically how worth while were uh, was pelvosically benefits of pelvosically meets expectation satisfaction from the pelvosically and uh, they were scoring 0 to 100 and these are the results and approximately 92.2 percent reported that the side effect were as expected or even better than the expected and most patients across the all countries felt their treatment would help them return to the normal life this is the very important issue and nearly all felt that the medications benefit had met or exceeds their expectations so uh, patient satisfaction which is the most important for uh, before for uh, the treatment of uh, each and every patients and approximately 90 percent patients are satisfied satisfied from their treatment and approximately 90 percent patients has a has a side effect expected or less than expected and 70 percent patients return their normal lifestyle life this is the very important issue because uh, most of patients who are taking chemotherapy uh, for the cancer they they have a, a very bad life so uh, with the help of pelvosicly we can uh, prevent this type of bad experience now we will discuss about the indian experience and the real world evidence of pelvosicly first of all from the rajiv gandhi hospital the, this is the largest real world data from indian population coming from uh, Rajiv Gandhi as well as the BLK Hospital Delhi. In this, they took 188 patients from February 2017 to May 2020. And uh, results shows that the median progression free survival was 22.2 months, while uh, in second line, median progression free survival was 12 months, while overall response rate was 80%, and overall response in second line was 47.9%. Toxicity, only 10% patient has grade 3 and 4 events, while 20% patient has neutropenia, grade 3 coil, while no patient has febrile neutropenia. It means, according to this trial, Indian patients have less uh, neutropenia than the Western population. And the conclusion of this study was, the present real world data of pelvosicly use in Indian population suggests similar effectiveness to previously published real world evidence and the standard of care for first line and the, as well as the second line treatment for hormone positive and HER2 negative metastatic breast cancer. And these uh, data are from another sites in India in uh, multicentric retrospective study from the South India. They analyzed uh, real world data from 133 patients and what they found that 62.4 percent in the first line setting and 36 7.6 percent in the second line setting and the median age was 56 percent and uh, according to this uh, um, survey uh, there is also uh, less neutropenia neutropenia is only in 75.2 percent of any grade while uh, grade 3 is only 23 percent while no febrile neutropenia while in trials, there is 1.8% uh, incidence of febrile, febrile neutropenia, but in the real, real world data from India, there is no febrile neutropenia. So they were also conclude that the pelvosiclip is similarly effect, effective as well as safe in Indian population as in the Paloma trials. Neutropenia, it, although the commonest side effect, which were uncomplicated and easily managed with the dose delay, using CDK4 and 6 inhibitor with the hormone therapy, has been become the standard of care for hormone positive metastatic breast cancer and in some uh, uh, studies they were found that the neutropenia may be a prognostic sign uh, for uh, effectiveness of pelvosicly in, uh, in, in according to one trial which was published in nature that the, if patient has neutropenia in first and second cycle they there are more chances that the pelvosicly is more effective in these type of patients so we can uh, take a neutropenia as an indicator of the prognos uh, prognostic uh, marker for the pelvosicly. So this is another uh, um, real world data from India. In this, they were also have approximately similar results. So in conclusion, the complete response rate was found in 19%, approximately same in the previous trials and approximately same results. 
So uh, uh, take home message that the in patients with the metastatic breast cancer, available evidence does not support the local regional treatment, but the decision should be individualized based on the patients and the tumor characteristic, site and number of the uh, metastasis and the response to systemic therapy. Endocrine therapy rather than the chemotherapy is the preferred in the patients with hormone positive metastatic breast cancer, especially if the patient is not in vessel crisis. Chemotherapy may be offered for those who are highly symptomatic as well as in vessel crisis. Combination of AI with the pelvociclip is the first preferred first line hormone therapy for metastatic breast cancer. While in premenopausal women, we can uh, either ablate ovary medically or surgically. And then we can give pelvociclip plus AA. At present, uh, ESR1 testing does not recommend it for the routine clinical practice, as well you all know. And the combination of pelvostent and pelvociclip should be offered to patients who have progressed to an and uh, NI. So, has pelvociclip changed the treatment paradigm? Uh, uh, we will discuss uh, all these data, and this indicates that the prior to 2015, no new treatment option for the advanced or metastatic breast cancer patients has been introduced since the AI for our uh, last few decades. And we will little know about the CTK4 and 6. After uh, experience with the CTK4 and 6, and uh, this drug will come in scenario. And now we have enough randomized trial data as well as real world data that the pelvociclip is the treatment of choice for uh, metastatic breast cancer, hormone positive and HER2 negative with either aromatase inhibitor or uh, pelvostent according to the indications. So uh, pelvociclip and letrozole is the first line treatment for metastatic breast cancer with median progression free survival more than two years. The real world data complements the superior clinical efficacy observed in the randomized clinical trial and supports the use of pelvociclip in combination with an aromatase inhibitor as a standard of care for first-line treatment of heart hormone positive breast cancers. No evidence of specific cumulative or delay toxicity with the pelvociclip plus endocrine therapy was found and the monitoring complete blood count prior to the start of pelvociclip at the beginning of each cycle as well as on the fifth day of the first two cycle is clinically indicated and the quality of life is very well maintained with the pelvociclip based treatment. Uh, in all um, uh, patients. So the final word is that the pelvociclip represents a significant advance in the care of autopositive metastatic breast cancer and the first line therapy manageable with the manageable adverse effects and presently quality of life for the most patient is uh, maintained with the pelvociclip based treatment. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, now uh, we will invite Dr. Pankaj Tanatia for start uh, panel discussion. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you, uh, Dr. Beniwal, sir, and the organizers for giving me such a great opportunity to be here. And um, uh, your lecture was great, sir, almost. 90% of answers of my case has already been uh, answered by your lecture. The person who has listened to your lecture have uh, uh, would tell the answers within a second, I'm sure. So uh, I'm sharing. Uh, can I do screen share? So, uh, you want Should to share your slides? Screen? Yes. Support team? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm sharing at the moment. Is it fine now?
Pankaj sir, please turn. Yes, am I audible? Now? Your, yes, sir, now audible. Yes. Okay, okay. Moving. Yes. Uh, everybody can see the screen. So, yes, uh, sir, visible. Okay, okay, thank you. So, uh, uh, I have been given to discuss uh, case discussion on CD4 and 6 inhibitors. So uh, I call my lecture as magic bullets. So these magic bullets have really changed the uh, way to treat hormone positive metastatic breast cancer. I'm sure with time we will get these bullets in um, upfront treatment of uh, early hormone positive breast cancers too. So let's begin with the case one, 56 year old female came to our OPD with history of feeling of lump or swelling in right breast. On examination, swelling was firm to hard, painless, movable, and was about 3 cm in diameter. There was no palpable lymphadenopathy in axillary or neck region. Metastatic workup was done, suggestive of uh, normal. She also had history of amenorrhea since 5 years. So as usual, uh, MRM was done, followed by 4 cycles of AC and 4 texel, followed by hormone therapy. So now my first question to uh, our uh, uh, panelists is, uh, what should be done? Uh, what should be the level of ER to be considered as positive, not only positive, but should be effective for hormone therapy? Uh, you know, Pankaj, uh, uh, for positivity, we have to consider more than one per percent ER, uh, ER for uh, positivity. And we have to give treatment of hormone therapy patient has more than 1%. But if patient has, if, if uh, percentage is more than 1%, then uh, there is a very good effectiveness uh, of hormone receptors. Less than 10%, uh, there are less chances of uh, working. But we have to give hormone therapy if, it's, if there is 1% or more than 1%. Absolutely right, sir. We consider it as positive, but yes, effectiveness is there better when uh, you have a level of more than 10 percent so uh, uh, yes so here you can see this is a article from uh, a very good journal uh, so here you can see these are uh, that are uh, er low that is one to ten percent range may not be as dependent and responsive to endocrine based therapies as those with the higher er expression so uh, after 10 years, she uh, had uh, hormone therapy for 10 years and she completed it. Then uh, hormone therapy was also stopped and patient was kept on observation. So uh, after six months, we called her for follow-up. Examination was done and uh, uh, further investigations were done. And what we saw was um, a liver as well of 3.2 centimeter into 2.3 centimeter. FNAC shows uh, metastatic disease. Biopsy with ERPR and HER2 new was same, that is ERPR positive and HER2 new negative. So, uh, uh, Dr. Rajesh Sivar, uh, uh, the question is for you when do we call it a case as endocrine sensitive or endocrine resistant? Hello. Hello, ha, Rajesh, we ah. can hear you. If there is no progression within uh, 12 months, then this is a case of uh, hormone sensitive, endocrine sensitive. Or if progress within 12 months, then it may be endocrine resistant and progression of disease. Yes, either uh, uh, progression within 12 months or uh, progressive disease ongoing treatment. During treatment, the ongoing therapy. treatment. Yes, 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 yes. yes. So we call, so I'll, uh, uh, yes, uh, the answer is correct and I'll repeat it. Uh, here you can see that endocrine sensitive disease includes the new metastatic disease and the patient who reoccurred more than a year after completing adjuvant endocrine treatment. Whereas endocrine resistant include those patients who reoccurred while receiving or within progressing while receiving endocrine treatment for advanced disease. Uh, 
Am I audible? Yes, audible. Yes, yes. Okay. So let's move on to our next question. So uh, Rajesh, is this case is now hormone receptor sensitive or resistant? Sensitive. Within six months. Uh, within uh, twelve months, I if it will be within twelve months, it will be resistant. There is request in si within six months, no? Within twelve months. In this case. Ah, uh, there is request within six months. So, uh, patient is resistant. Resistant, resistant. Yes. Uh, uh, so, yeah, she is hormone receptor of, resistant, or you can say early relapse. Yes. Relapse. Okay, so our patient is hormone receptor resistant case of resistant. metastatic breast cancer with ERPR positive or negative. Point. And uh, one more thing I forget to mention. Okay, it's done. So now, what will be the plan of action? At this point, we have to we have, we have a uh, Dr. Beninal sir. The question is for Dr. Beninal sir. Sir, what will be our plan of action? We have we are having a case of uh, metastatic breast cancer with the uh, ERPR positive and uh, uh, HER2 negative with uh, resistant uh, hormone therapy resistant case. Uh, first of all, uh, we have to. Uh... Uh, I want to uh, know about the symptoms of this patient. Is this patient in visceral crisis or a uh, patient has asymptomatic uh, liver metastasis? Sir. No, sir. Patient doesn't have symptoms. She, she just came for a follow-up examination and mm -hmm. we found a liver as well of 3.2 centimeter. The patient is doing very well uh, 10 years with the hormone therapy and then she has recurrence. So, uh, and patient is still uh, asymptomatic. So, we have to uh, give hormone therapy. So, in this patient, uh, my plan is palbociclib with uh, uh, letrozole. And uh, as we all know that the approximately 40% uh, patient has PA3K uh, mutations nowadays. So we have to do PA3K mutation analysis in this, but the first plan is palbociclib with the letrozole in this type of case. Yes, sir. You're absolutely right, sir. So uh, we did a PET scan even to see whether a uh, patient may have brain mats or somewhere else mats are present or not bone mats. Or yeah, any yeah we can do baseline PET scan after starting treatment. Yes. So. Uh, what we saw was PET scan was more or less normal, except the liver mats, was, which we have already explained. PI3 kinase mutation uh, was done and was negative. And then uh, uh, treatment plan, you have already told us that CDK4 inhibitor, 4 6 inhibitor with hormone therapy. Okay. So, yes, so chemotherapy is reserved for visceral crisis, as you already said, and uh, it is defined <clears throat> as symptomatic patient. So what we what our plan will be? It will be CDK4 or 6 inhibitor with full vision, as sir said. Now we have started it. Now here is a second case. 52 year old female came to our OPD with an open wound. 52 year old female came to our OPD with an open wound in right breast. It was about five centimeter in diameter and two centimeter in depth with palpable right axillary lymph node of about 3 cm in diameter. PET CT suggestive of bone mats with rest of the scan was normal. She also had history of amenorrhea since 3 years. Biopsy breast was uh, suggestive of uh, infected ductal carcinoma. ERPR positive, 100%, HER2 negative, and PI3 kinase was also negative. Now, sir, what will be the treatment plan? Chemotherapy, hormone therapy or CDK4 or the combination of anything. Uh, your, your voice is uh, not clear. Can, can you, can you uh, tell me the characteristic of patient? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Am I audible, sir? Yeah, yeah. Now you're audible. Okay. 52 year old female came to our OPD with an open wound in right breast. It was about five centimeter in diameter. Right exit lymph node was about 3 cm. Am I audible, okay. sir? Yeah, yeah. It's meant patient is patient is only have only bone metastasis. 
patient have only bone metastasis yes sir uh, and, and and i think i think this this patient is ideal for uh, cdk 46 inhibitor with hormone therapy yes we have to give the combination of cdk 4 inhibitor with, with hormone therapy bis, with bis, bis phosphonates so we have yes, to so, add lonic acid or denosumab yes yes sir lonic acid or denosumab so uh, as sir said you can see the uh, article from As uh, ascopubs it confirms that cdk46 inhibitor had similar efficacy when associated with ai in first line treatment of uh, hormone receptor positive advanced breast cancer with superior to either full bistent or ai monotherapy regardless of any other patient or tumor characteristics so if you have a uh, metastatic breast cancer disease patient arpr positive her2 negative go directly for cdk4 inhibitor with hormone uh, therapy that is a uh, full bistent or uh, uh, anastrozole whatever be your choice or available choice will be there at the moment so cdk4 6 inhibitor with full bistent was started dfs was 2 years patient came back with sudden dyspnea on examination bilateral chest ronchi was present and uh, she had no pallor ictus or lymphadenopathy uh, usg abdomen pelvis cst of liver mats chest x ray shows multiple coin shaped shadows that is lung mats so uh, dr rajesh what will be uh, what will the difference between so it is a case of uh, uh, visceral disease right visceral disease already there but now the symptomatic uh, symptom are worse than previous so we can say it but, visceral uh, crisis crisis so uh, rajesh yes, we have a, a lot of pgs with us uh so can we uh, uh discuss uh, can you explain us uh, like uh, what is the difference between visceral disease and visceral crisis visceral disease only said when that the imaging suggests that the liver mats are there but patient is totally asymptomatic no pain abdomen or uh, in imaging we may see lung mats but patient is uh, <coughs> not uh, dyspneic that is visceral disease when when the patient okay. began uh, symptomatic cough pain abdomen bone mats multiple and uh, severe dyspnea then this is a visceral crisis and further treatment the in visceral crisis we may start uh, the chemo i think dr pankaj is not audible hello yeah there is i think there is network problem okay okay am i audible now yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. am i audible now yeah audible yes so basically audible so basically when okay when uh, uh, basically rajesh ji uh, you mean that patient is symptomatic yes. with visceral disease symptomatic, symptomatic regarding the metastatic site that we called as yeah. visceral crisis and the yes. patient is doesn't have symptoms and that is visceral disease visceral disease okay yes absolutely okay. right so uh, here as uh, dr ajish sinhar ji said visceral crisis refer to the patient who at presentation have significant symptoms from large tumor burden such as shortening of breath or liver dysfunction from uh, lung liver mats respectively chemotherapy leads to a more rapid response than endocrine therapy so yes. chemotherapy is uh, always we have a choice that uh, we have to give a chemotherapy gemstabine or any other second line therapy to make him asymptomatic so uh, dr rajesh ji uh, yeah. what would be your treatment plan now another cdk4 inhibitor another hormone therapy or chemotherapy yeah we may use second line hormone therapy fulvestent we add on fulvestent fulvestent uh, already With the... uh, we have given him Uh, I think yes, fulvestant already been given. A CDK four inhibitor CDK and a fulvestant already been given. Inhibitor. Yes. P I K three negative then. Ah, uh, P I three yeah negative negative it's, uh, negative. it's negative right? Ah, uh, negative. Yes. But at this time patient is dyspneic, na? No? Yes, sir. Ah, uh, at this time patient is dyspneic. That's why it 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 means it is in the visceral crisis. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, so then, then okay. we have to give. Then we have to give chemotherapy right now. If patient is dyspneic, uh, then it means it is in visceral yeah. crisis. Then we have to start chemotherapy. Uh, so as per this article, what I saw that uh, 
नो कीमोथेरेपी रेजिमेंट विद और विदाउट टारगेट थेरेपी इज सिग्निफिकेंटली बेटर देन सीडी के फोर इनिबिटर प्लस हार्मोथेरेपी इन टर्म्स ऑफ प्रोग्रेशन ऑफ सर्वाइवल इन विसर क्राइसिस substantial proportion of patient continue to maintain clinical benefit with another cdk46 inhibitor after previous cdk46 inhibitor highlighting the potential of their use after cdk46 blockade okay in this in this recent analysis uh, it means we can also give hormone therapy in visceral cases also yes sir yes sir uh, yes, we yes, can yes, continue okay. our hormone therapy with another cdk4 inhibitor so that may respond better than chemotherapy okay Yeah, there is no other study, uh, prospective study, between comparison between chemotherapy and hormone therapy. So we put on another switch over to CDK4 inhibitors, another one. Yes, so we have to, uh, we can uh, make up a uh, another CDK4 inhibitor for these patients. So here is another point for uh, uh, another. Uh, Uh, which one point in support to my words that ribociclib seems to perform better in acquired resistance setting uh, abimaciclib seems to perform better in the primary endocrine resistance setting despite promising result with pelvociclib in pre treated patients the data on overall survival are still inconclusive overall the adjunct of cdk46 inhibitor in patient with visceral disease versus patients who did not have visceral metastasis was beneficial in all the three trials okay so we can give a second line therapy with a cdk4 inhibitor <clears throat> so another cdk4 inhibitor yeah. ribociclib with hormone therapy was started and uh, patient had a very good effect and symptoms symptoms were relieved so four months later patient had neutropenia it might be due to a cdk4 6 inhibitor so uh, sir what would yeah. be the plan of action um it depends upon the grade of neutropenia if patient has grade 4 neutropenia then we can uh, if patient has grade 4 uh, neutropenia then we can uh, delay the uh, cdk4 inhibitor and then we can reduce the dose of uh, cdk inhibitors and if patient has grade 1 and 2 uh, to neutropenia then we have to continue same drugs same same, yes, same dose yes you are right we can reduce the dose of cdk4 inhibitor and uh, this slide has already been explained by dr binwar sir i won't go in detail into that uh, but yes he is absolutely right uh, if, even if you decrease the dose of cdk4 inhibitor uh, there is no difference in progression free survival for these patients and uh, will show a better to the adverse effect which they are complicating so another the last case a uh, 52 year old female came to our opd so, so the uh, this is the hypothetical case the same uh, history as before but the difference in that was that uh, this patient has pi3 kinase mutation positive with erpr positive her to negative breast cancer so uh, dr benival sir what will be our treatment plan in this patient and if, if it is pi3 kinase mutation positive then we have to give alpelacib with uh, hormone therapy either with fulvestent or leprosol we have to start alpelacib with fulvestent or leprosol uh, i would contradict your statement sir um as per the asco pubs uh, you can see alpelacib. that alpelacib uh, sir alpelacib alpelacib plus taken... fulvestent second uh, they, there are both options we can we can we can try still ctk 4 and 6 inhibitor in the first line Or, yes, or or we can also uh, try alpelacib yes. for the stent in first line because because uh, alpelacib is the last uh, option for this type of person so we can try uh, first try ctk4 yes, inhibitors sir. plus ai then we yes, can uh, do this then we'll go for alpelacib uh, alpelacib plus for which so uh, on the base of solar one the us fda approved alpelacib for pi3 ca mutated advanced uh, hormone receptor positive breast cancers in combination full vision the magnitude of benefit for patient treated with alpelacib and full vision similar to that seen in cdk46 inhibitor and full vision in similar population since cdk46 yes. inhibitor have more favorable toxicity profile than alpelacib so more oncologist will likely to choose a cdk46 inhibitor so primary will be a cdk46 inhibitor so thank you thank you very much sir thank you very much rajesh ji it was a great discussion and uh, i'm sure uh, people who have joined this webinar uh, will be really benefiting from 
these kinds of academic phase. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Pankas. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, all of all of you, especially Dr. Pankas, Dr. Rajesh, and Dr. Uh, Dr. Ghar, uh, for giving a valuable time for uh, such type of great, great discussion. And I will also like to give thanks to Pfizer Peoples for uh, giving a platform to discuss such type of uh, important topic uh, in clinical scenario. So right in uh, right now in, in COVID era, oral treatment is very important for patients because patients are uh, cannot come frequently in hospital so oral treatment like valbosiclib and other cdk inhibitors is uh, even more important in covid era than the pre-covid era so uh, we learned that the, we can uh, treat uh, such type of patients without chemotherapy so thank you very much all of you and now i will hand over uh, to uh, this to organizing team thank you so much sir